Hi, everyone. So thank you for that wonderful introduction and a big thank you to Manage Energy for inviting me to be here. And thank you all for being here and showing up past 6 p.m. I know it's been a very long day, um, but I hope that today's talk energizes you um, and prepares you to go out into the world and, and keep being activists. So I first learned about the climate crisis at the age of 11. I learned about the climate crisis through documentaries. And I remember sitting glued to my computer screen, feeling grief. I remember feeling incredibly angry. But I think more than anything, I remember feeling really confused. I couldn't understand why I hadn't learned about the climate crisis in school why I hadn't seen it on TV when my parents watched the news, why we didn't talk about it at the dinner table. It felt as if the adults in my life were sleepwalking, even as the science showed us we were hurtling toward this cliff of climate collapse. And back then, I figured that the issue must simply be that not enough people knew about the climate crisis. Now, skip ahead 13 years, and climate awareness is the highest it has ever been. Yet in many ways, we are going backwards. Take for the fact that the richest 26 people today own as much wealth as the poorest 3.8 billion. Today, over 80% of the world's original forests have been destroyed largely through industries including animal agriculture, meat and dairy, causing untold species extinction. And one that you should all be very familiar with, we now have less than a decade to halve global emissions and to avoid the 1.5 degree climate tipping point. Now, in spite of what the science tells us, many countries and companies have actively not only stagnated their actions on climate and their commitments, but actively reversed them. Just last year, a study found that over 58% of the world's largest corporations have put forward climate commitments that are in direct opposition to their own lobbying activities. And in 2022, Deloitte conducted a study they asked business leaders, what's the number one benefit of taking action on sustainability? And most business leaders didn't say, you know, taking action on the climate crisis, but public perception. So today, many companies are more concerned with being seen to do the right thing than actually doing it. Take BP, who consistently position themselves as a green leader. In just one quarter of last year, from July to September, BP invested two billion pounds in fossil fuels. For every one pound that they spent on low carbon investments, they spent 11 pounds on fossil fuels and gave nine pounds back to their shareholders. Then there's HSBC. In 2022, they claimed that they would end all funding for fossil fuel projects. However, they have since helped to raise 37 billion pounds for companies expanding their oil and gas production. Now, none of this should come as a surprise. For decades, fossil fuel companies and their allies have tried every tactic in the book, in the book to prevent progress on climate action. And it's clear at this point, as we approach COP29, that we cannot trust in the goodness of companies to do the right or responsible thing. And yet, so much in our political system continues to support them. In 2022, global fossil fuel subsidies surged to 7 trillion US dollars which means that every day there are CEOs, finance ministers, development bankers who are pouring money into propping up oil and gas. Now, it's estimated 
that in order to avoid the 1.5 degree climate tipping point, investment in clean energy needs to reach four and a half trillion US dollars per year by 2030. So how do we move from a fossil fuel economy to a green and regenerative one? Rapid progress is needed in five key areas. For one, technology, such as upgrading our grid infrastructure. Two, resources, how we supply materials. Three, society, upskilling and training the workforce and ensuring a just transition for workers. Four, finance, of course, developing support mechanisms such as subsidies, tax incentives and grants to encourage investment in green energy. And obviously, politics. We need regulation that holds companies and their shareholders to account. Now, there are loads of smart people at Brent's and of course in this room who can tell you in intricate detail the change that is needed in each of these areas. I'm not that person. <laughs> I'm not a policy nerd and I'm not an expert in technology. I am an activist. But what I can tell you is that in my 13 years of activism, working with business leaders, teachers, students, policymakers, it's that the biggest challenge we need to overcome is not pictured here. It is, in fact, at the intersection of all of these areas. And that is mindset. Now, we can think of mindset as the beliefs, ideas, and attitudes that we hold about the climate crisis, about the world, and about our role in it. And oftentimes, mindset can be illuminated by the stories that we subscribe to. I'd like to share some of the stories that I've heard working with business leaders, and these are direct quotes. There was the leader at a fast-moving consumer goods company who told me, we're a global for-profit company in the consumer space. Our core business and associated business model are fundamentally at odds with sustainability. There was the leader at a legal firm who told me, we shouldn't have to do anything until China stops burning coal. And then the leader at a consulting firm who said, we've done what can reasonably be expected without hurting the business's competitiveness. These stories reveal to us the mindset of business as usual. From shirking responsibility and pointing the finger elsewhere to prioritizing short-term profit making. And it's easy to see how these types of thinking get in the way of our ability to make meaningful progress on the climate crisis. Now, the other thing I've observed is that the world of policy has its own unique mindset barriers. And there are three in particular that stand out to me. The first is resistance to change. In other words, sticking to what feels comfortable and familiar. In the context of the climate crisis, this can show up as people feeling attached to business as usual, to existing ways of working, existing energy systems, and of course, technologies. This can manifest as an incremental approach to the renewable transition and loads of red tape. According to the European Environmental Bureau, new renewable projects can require sign-off from as many as 30 independent authorities to receive the green light. And this bureaucracy is often what kills them in their tracks. Then there's short-term thinking. Now, this is the product of a political system that is wedded to short-term election cycles. People want to see immediate outcomes. But it's reinforced by a number of cultural influences, by consumerism, finance, quarterly profit statements, the news media cycle, and of course, social media algorithms. And short-term thinking is often born from a place of fear. We've seen this in the wake of COVID and the war in Ukraine. Many countries in Europe have either pushed deadlines to shut down their coal plants, reinstated them, or lifted production caps. 
Now, I want us to take a hypothetical scenario to see how this mindset of short-term thinking may play out. Now, say in the face of political instability, a government decides to provide tax breaks and subsidies to coal mining companies. This decision is popular in the short term. It promises to boost local economies and generate jobs. And this messaging obviously appeals to voters. Yet the ramp up in coal production leads to worse air quality, environmental pollution, and of course, increased emissions. Over the next decade, this country faces severe climate impacts and huge financial losses due to disaster management, healthcare, and of course, repairing infrastructure. In the same period, the global market shifts toward renewables. The country finds itself lagging behind the clean energy sector. The coal mine inevitably becomes economically unviable, a stranded asset resulting in job losses and economic decline in mining regions. Now, while this is a hypothetical, it's a story that we're seeing play out in real time. The third mindset barrier that I've observed in politics is fear of backlash. And this feels especially relevant in today's political climate, when politics is trending toward the right. People across Europe have been squeezed by the cost of living crisis and by rising energy bills. And the far right have weaponized this struggle. They've picked up issues that feel immediate, such as inflation, lack of jobs, or the housing crisis, and leveled blame at things like immigration and green policies. And they have, in large part, been able to do this because many progressive leaders have not listened to the struggles of everyday working class communities. They've often expended their energy talking about why the other side is so bad without offering a compelling alternative. They've used language that people can't necessarily connect to. And they haven't demonstrated clearly how green policies can tangibly improve people's lives without burdening them financially. Many policymakers today are merely delaying the inevitable by clinging onto the current system. In the meantime, we are losing our window to act decisively on the climate and ecological crisis. So how do we start to transform each of these mindsets? For one, we need to move from resistance to change to embracing disruption. So much in our culture tries to switch us off from the climate crisis, to lull us into a false sense of complacency. But it's not only up to climate scientists to ring the alarm. They have been trying to do that for decades. It's on each and every one of us. We need to be able to name the problem, and that includes calling out and challenging business as usual. It means calling out bad actors, including fossil fuel companies, but also the system that enables them, including their allies in finance, media, and politics. And the truth is, calling out the status quo is not always comfortable. Just recently, I was at an event in Paris addressing a room full of business leaders. I was sharing the latest climate science, and as I've done today, sharing the ways in which we're not making action and progress fast enough. Midway through my presentation, people in the audience started to boo and heckle. Now, I made it to the end of my speech and to the exit before I burst into tears. And I called my boyfriend and said, I just don't know if I can keep doing this. Now, afterwards, I received loads of messages from people saying, that was really empowering, and I now feel like I can have difficult conversations at work. And I was really glad that the message had gotten through. But I couldn't help but wish just one person had spoken out in that room and not behind the comfort of an email or a LinkedIn direct message because this work can be hard and alienating. We need to defend the people who are brave enough to disrupt the status quo, and we need to be those people. 
That can look like taking to the streets, like these civil rights protesters pictured here, or using your voice among friends, at the dinner table, and of course, where you spend the majority of your time, at work. Second, we need to move from short-term thinking to long-term vision. Once we've understood the problem, the challenges we face, we need to ask ourselves, what are we working toward? We can move from asking, why is the system the way that it is, to what if we did things really differently? Let's take the rise in urbanization, the fact that every day thousands of people are moving out of rural areas. We can take this mass migration as an opportunity to rethink our cities. Imagine if, instead of prioritizing cars, for example, we centered people and pedestrians. In place of roads and parking, we could invest in parks for children, green spaces that make our cities more climate resilient, community allotments that localize our food production, and wildlife corridors that bring back biodiversity. We could encourage micro-mobility, such as walking and cycling, and in doing so, reduce air pollution and improve people's health. For long distances, we could invest in train infrastructure over driving or flying as what I find both a more sustainable but also more enjoyable way of traveling. We could also retrofit buildings to make them more energy efficient instead of constantly building anew. And as you all well know, these aren't merely hypotheticals. These solutions are already being piloted and scaled around the world. Take Ljubljana, the capital city of Slovenia. In 2017, the city embarked on a major energy efficiency project. They retrofitted 48 buildings, including sports halls, schools, and health centers. And they went on to retrofit a further 11 buildings in 2019 and 27 buildings in 2020. And off the back of their success, just last year, they announced the construction of 51 photovoltaic units on public buildings, which are pictured here. And this is the largest solar community project in the whole country. Now, what's super cool about this example is not just the scale, but that it's the largest ever public and private partnership of its kind in Southeastern Europe. At its heart is collaboration, which takes us to our third mindset shift. We need to let go of fear of backlash and move toward radical collaboration. We need dialogue with a broad range of stakeholders, including those who have been left behind and feel excluded by the politics of today. Citizens' assemblies offer a great template for what it can look like to platform a real diversity of voices and lived experience. We, of course, also need to center young people, the generation who will inherit the consequences and impacts of the decisions that we're making today. And ultimately, within the corridors of power, we need to foster cross-party agreements. Now, collaboration requires a couple of different skills. For one, we need communication. As we've discussed, we need to be able to articulate the problem, the solution, and the bridge to getting there. But even more importantly, we need to understand people. We need to put in the work by meeting people where they are. What do they value? What do they care about? What are they struggling with? And critically, what are they good at? So that we can find places for people within this movement. Now, there's one final message that I would like to share with all of you. I know that the climate crisis is huge, complex, overwhelming. And the scale of change that is required also feels that way. And in that context, it is really normal and easy to feel powerless. Whether it's working with students in the classroom or leaders in the boardroom, I often hear stories such as, the system is too broken, it's impossible to fix. Or, I'm just one in eight billion people. What difference can I possibly make? And as I hope today has demonstrated, we all hold stories that limit our ability to create change, 
that belittle what we're capable of. So I invite you to reflect on what that story might be for yourself. And of course, I invite you to challenge it. It is true that as individuals working alone, we will only ever get so far. However, as a movement, I truly believe that anything is possible. It is on each of us to take action because no one is going to do it for us. Take the civil rights movement, the suffragettes, the Stonewall uprising. Change did not happen from the top down, but from the bottom up, from people who refused to accept the system as it then was. They knew pain and, of course, they knew grief. But they also knew tremendous courage. They dared to imagine a more just and a more beautiful world, especially when it felt impossible. Just last week, it was Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN, who said, it's we, the people, versus the polluters and the profiteers. Together, we can win. But it's time for leaders to decide whose side they're on. Tomorrow is too late. Now is the time to mobilize. Now is the time to act. Thank you. <laughs>